is a very good, we could start it. And uh, you will be talking about quantum probability and its applications. And when you was in Delhi, I think the ISI Delhi was the center, world center for quantum probability. So it's very nice to have you. Thanks, Raja and Joydeb. I see Joydeb is here. There he is, yes. <coughs> yeah. Well, I thought, uh, well, actually, I suggested this to Raja that uh, quantum, what is called quantum probability, I would briefly say what the term means. But before I begin, uh, let me take a survey. How many people have some introduction to theory of probability? One, two, three, three and a half. <laughs> you, I know. <laughs> okay, so uh, you also, okay. So by and large, I think uh, the majority, I mean, do not seem to have had any introduction to probability. So what I will do, uh, I will keep my language as uh, sort of as far away from probability as possible with occasional foray into it to make connections okay now this is a the what i'm going to describe is a part of what is goes under the name of uh, a larger body called non commutative probability theory uh, it has uh, various uh, avatars and i will be talking about only one, and that also I'll restrict to what goes under the name of uh, stochastic calculus, quantum stochastic calculus. The word quantum came from, as you may have guessed, uh, the, the large amount of theory of operators actually emerged from quantum mechanics. Okay, around 19, late 1920s, early 1930s, uh, it emerged with the work of uh, Rish and Naj, which was before actually, uh, which dates back a little before quantum mechanics, and then, I mean, coincided with it, and then von Neumann, who was the main architect uh, of a major development in operator theory and what are now called operator algebras, and with his uh, two assistants, postdoctoral assistants, like some of you are. Uh, one was Arving Siegel other was Halmos, okay. Von Neumann had two postdocs, so-called. One was Halmos, other was Sigal, Arving Sigal, each of which came to make a big mark in various areas of uh, operator theory and applications. I'm sure most of you have heard of these two names. Uh, Halmos, of course, wrote many books. Unlike Sigal, Sigal, I don't think, wrote many books. But he, I think he was the first to introduce what is known as now non-commutative integration theory. That dates back to, I think, 1940 when he wrote his first paper on non-commutative integrations. So that's how the thing developed. And of course, as you know now, it is a operator theory is a subject by itself uh, in its own right and, uh, and so on. But non commutative probability theory, of which what I'm going to talk about is a part, begins, as I said, had its uh, historical origin in the context of quantum mechanics, but then uh, evolved in very many different ways. So let me quickly give you an introduction to that. I will have a, so for probabilists, a little bit of language. So if you want to ignore it, you can ignore it. There is no real probability theory that I'm going to do. So and here is, so this is classical. Here I would call quantum or non-commutative probability theory. So I will mostly stay in this, but just to give the language, so here you will have a probability, you will have a space, okay, where this thing is going to be sitting, the whole theory. So that as yesterday's lecture 
started with is the standard omega f mu, omega is this measure space, f is the sigma algebra, and mu is the probability measure. So what does that get replaced by here? Now it has again, as I said, many avatars. I won't go into the most abstract avatar. I will come out. So there are certain prehistoric theory, which I will not get into. So the outcome is you have a Hilbert space, which I will always designate something like that, script H. And so omega f in some sense gets replaced by this Hilbert space. So that's a very strange replacement, but that's the way it is. Mu gets replaced by something which I will designate as rho. What is rho? Rho is a positive trace class operator in H. Trace class positive, so it suffices to say that it has a trace. If it has a trace in one basis, then you can easily show it has the same positive number as trace in all basis. Because of positivity, that forces the good definition of trace. So this mu is replaced by rho. Then comes what is known as expectation. In classical theory, they call it expectation. In this theory also, that same name persists. You call it expectation. And often, you write this. So to be explicit, you will have, let's say, f. OK, what is f? f is a random variable in this language. What is a random variable? It is nothing but a map from this space to, let's say, real or complex or even some topological space valued function. So here, let me take complex. So it is a complex valued function on this probability space. An expectation then is given as an integral of that function with respect to this measure given there. Okay. So this integration is over omega. Now here what the corresponding language. So the random variable gets replaced by, now here I have put a complex valued to have the analogy more or less parallel, I would replace it by let's say, I would call it families of admissible operator. Now, what do we mean by admissible has to be explained. Linear, I will not be deviating from linear theory, linear operators in the Hilbert space. Now, unlike here, you see, the, this integral, existence of this integral is governed by Lebesgue theory. So we know what it means by the classical Lebesgue theory. The, uh, one of consequences of which is that you, since I've taken complex valued, you cannot admit an expectation value infinity, okay? That is the Lebesgue theory says that you do not, that means f has to be integrable. In other words, what is goes under the name of f being integrability? That means you don't admit complex infinity as a value here. Here, same question will come up once I have defined what an expectation is. So here, this says this expectation with respect to this probability measure. Here it, says it is the expectation relative to this object. So operator, so let me write as a generic form operator given by the capital A. So this is defined to be trace. That's what I mean by when I say admissible, I am already anticipating trouble on the right hand side. This may not exist just as here, okay. So certain amount of existence issue has to be dealt with. That means this will be a complex number only if A belongs to a certain subclass, which I am not going to spend any time on, right? This right hand side may not be defined. So you have to study separately what class of operators A for which this could be defined. There are many possibilities of this, uh, but I want
go into that because that is not my main uh, interest. So this prehistory, it is again a bit of a digression. Prehistory means that there are more primitive theories which produce this Hilbert space. I won't, I won't go into that. Actually, this was uh, the big, the, the one of the earliest paper was due to von Neumann and Birkhoff, the senior Birkhoff, Garrett Birkhoff. Nineteen thirty something, late nineteen thirties, I think. When they wanted to study an axiomatics which will produce the Hilbert space structure. Okay. So people who are interested can go back and look at it. This uh, famous paper of von Neumann and Birkhoff. So we will start from a fact that, as if a Hilbert space is given to us. But, uh, yeah. Hmm? I forget the, you see after that paper it became, a, you see those days names were given very funnily. It was called geometry of, maybe it was called geometry of quantum mechanics, something like that. Okay. For example, the theory of operator algebras, one of the earliest papers was given the name by von Neumann as continuous geometry. He called it continuous unit. Bharadarajan has two volumes, which uh, this will be certainly the main topic there. Yeah. Yeah. Bharadarajan has two volumes, which is Geometry of Quantum Mechanics, I think that is the title. Which has come out in the Trim series, is it? Not that one? I thought they have reprinted it. Maybe Springer has reprinted it, I have seen it somewhere. Anyway, so we'll start from here, as if the Hilbert space is given. But the question then comes, what kind of Hilbert space is appropriate? Hilbert space, of course, we know that all Hilbert space are isomorphic given a fixed dimension. Okay, But that really doesn't say much. It is important to have more specific Hilbert spaces to describe systems in. Okay. So let me go quickly to, so instead of having a finite family of admissible random variables or operators with which you can compute the expectations and so on, once you know what is an expectation then variance is the next thing, okay, variance of two observables can be defined. times b minus expectation, this product trace thereof, provided it exists. So you see, you are, you are, you are getting into what, what, what is this getting into? It is obvious by linearity of trace, all it needs is that the expectation of course must exist, which is the line before. Second is expectation of the product must exist also. Trace of row AB must make sense. Okay. So trace of row A may exist, trace of row B may exist, but trace of row AB may not exist. So in other words, the, the set of random variables on which you take, make these calculations, does it form some kind of an algebra? So these questions come up, we won't get into that. But now what will the stochastic calculus that we will be talking about involves, so classically, stochastic calculus involves a parameterized family of random variables. Parameter usually is time, that means R plus from now to future. Family 
of random variables. That means on the right hand side it will be replaced by a parameterized family of operators. So it is not one operator, not 10 operators, but a continuum collection of operators. And we will have to learn to deal with them. So one theory which is convenient is the one that I am going to describe the details of. So to describe this kind of picture, the one choice of Hilbert space is the so-called Fox space. So H will be a Fox space over another Hilbert space. So here is a, all Hilbert spaces will be separable for me. So I won't repeat it and complex. So I won't repeat this. So this is often called the base space and this is the Fox space over the base space. So how does it go? So this is the definition. Let me put S2. So it is an infinite direct sum of Hilbert spaces. So this is the complex number. So it is a one dimensional space. This is the base space that you have started with. Okay. So I have to now define what these are. So HSN is the symmetrized, so S for symmetry or symmetrization, symmetrized n fold tensor product of the base space. For example, you take F and G in H. Okay, take two vectors. What is the symmetric tensor product of these two vectors? So this should be a member of HS2. I take two elements, I make a tensor product and then I symmetrize it. So it is quite clear what it should be. It is F tensor G plus G tensor F divided by, well, that is unimportant, I mean, uh, normalization, etc. So, essentially, you symmetrize over two points. So, you flip it. So, that is the example for two, and you can imagine for three, four, etc. Okay? So, you take tensor product of n elements and symmetrize it. Okay? And what is this direct sum? So, if I have direct sum of Hilbert spaces, let's say H, J, infinite direct sum. What do I mean? How do I make a Hilbert space out of it? So, that is a, a Cartesian product of H except the 0, 1 I understand as one dimensional object 0, okay, uh, C. Now I have to equip this with an inner product. Okay? So if I have F0, F1, etc. and I have another well imagine the inner product. This is defined to be sum over fj bar. By the way, yes, my antilinearity is in the left hand component. Okay, So I should warn you, there may be sometimes so this is an inner product. So j is equal to 0 to infinity. 
this inner product will be in H S J with 0 being understood as the complex number inner product. Okay? So, it is a sum of complex numbers, infinite sum of complex numbers. Of course, you have to answer the convergence issue. So, that is essentially, this is like an L2 space, small L2 space, except that it takes values in Hilbert spaces, different Hilbert spaces, which is convergent if just like small l2, if that infinite sum of positive numbers converges and that defines a norm and which is consistent with this inner product, etc, etc. Okay? So, that is a standard object. Now, there are names which again uh, like the word quantum which came from physics. Similarly, there are certain names which have come from physics. This sector, that is elements belonging to the 0th sector is called, this is called the vacuum sector. And the unit vector here 1, 1 is the unit vector there, this one dimensional space is called, that is so, this is a name which is convenient as a shorthand. Vacuum is this vector, all zeros except for the first entry, zeroth entry. Okay? That is goes by the name of vacuum, just a shorthand for that special vector. And uh, so, going back to this introduction, so I have given the Hilbert space of my interest, namely I, I will specialize uh, somewhat more, but at present it is of this structure with this inner product. So, that is the Hilbert space for us. Next, yeah. You want it to be a complex number, right? Oh yeah, for, I mean element, it will be an element here if this converges because then this will convert for every pair f and g. That's why I said it is like small l2 structure. Okay, so next thing is I have to give you a row. So my Hilbert space is specified by this, but next I have to give row. Row is a trace class operator. For us, it will be the rank 1. Uh, rank 1, well that is a trace positive rank, rank 1 projection actually onto the vacuum, that is this vector. So, that is obviously positive and uh, trace class because it is rank 1, so there is nothing to prove. And therefore, the expectation is with respect to the vacuum. It is said that you are taking vacuum expectation. That means I have chosen this very special row. And often I will not write anything, I will just write E to mean this. Just for making writing a little easier. Okay, now I have to get, so I am just going through the list in some way. Next thing I have to find what are sort of uh, sensible or useful family of operators with which I will next proceed. Okay. Those A's. So, some 
special operators in Fox space. So H is my, I fixed the Hilbert space as a Fox space. Sometimes, you know, the Fox space, oh, actually I should do something earlier. Okay, sometimes the Fox space, which structure has been given here, they are written, so H is sometimes written, sometimes it is probably more suggestive, the notation, with an S here. So S stands for symmetrization. This is the base space. And so this tells you that I am building something on top of a base space. And S stands for symmetrization. Uh, actually, I should give something before I give the operators, namely some structure of these. I should have said some special vectors rather than operators first. They're called exponential vectors. This is the name again. Where this notation becomes more transparent once I have defined this. So they are written E for exponential. I mean many people have different notation but I like the E because that smells of the word exponential. So I write E of F. So I take an F in space and I want to define this operator in the Fox space. So this is defined as follows. The 0th sector it is 1, the number 1. Second sector it is just number f, uh, the vector f. It should be a member of h. Third sector it is just the second tensor which is obviously symmetric because it is tensor with itself. But I put a normalization factor square root of 2 factorial in the denominator and so on. A generic term will be the n-fold tensor product and so on. So this vector you can compute its norm square in the Fox space by this uh, definition and you verify your it's trivial to see what it is going to be. So this E is the usual numerical exponential. Or more precisely or more transparently is this one. You would take two vectors and take their inner product as per that definition. It is the exponential of the inner products. So this is here, this is there. So inner product of exponential vectors in the Fox space is exponential of the inner products in the base space. Okay. So that gives you a structural transparency of the Fox space. Sometimes Fox space. That infinite series is always convergent. Of course. It gives you the infinite series of the exponential, that's all. Okay. Therefore, uh, in the old days, I think uh, Fox space was also called exponential Hilbert space. And the reason is quite clear why it was called exponential Hilbert space. Because of this functorial property. And, which I am not going to prove, this family So take all the exponential vectors for f running over a dense subset of the base space. Okay? That's a total set in the Fox space. So you have a kind of total set on which this functorial relationship is valid. That's hence the name exponential Hilbert space. So this is a very convenient set of vectors to work on. And the linear 
manifold generated by exponential vectors is what is going to interest us. I would suggest that you work out the proof, it is not very difficult. This proof depends on, I mean first you have to prove the linear independence and depends on the linear independence of ordinary exponentials. So this set, if x is not equal to y, they are linearly independent, right? E to the x is linearly independent of it y. If x and y are numbers, something similar is valid for vectors as well. So you can work out the little bit, think a little bit and work out the proof. Okay, so these, the, so the, I will work mostly with what I will call E of some suitable subspace M, which is uh, dense as well. So I will often even drop the E and I will just call, drop the M and call it E. That means I will look at the linear manifold generated by exponential vectors where F will come from some special subset, dense subset of the base space, convenient dense subspace. M could be H also in many cases, the whole, whole Hilbert space, sorry, the other one, the base space, sometimes, okay. Okay, now let me go to the next step, those special operators that I said earlier. Now I cannot resist a little dig at Joydeb at this point. Unfortunately all the operators will be unbounded. <laughs> okay, so let me, so first one in the list is called annihilation operator. This is not one operator, but this is a family of operators actually, infinite family, but of similar kind. So it is given one name. So for let f be in the base space h, then you would for every f, you define, you call it A sub A of f. So A for annihilation, the word annihilation, f is the vector. And I define its action by looking at what it does to those exponential vectors. Okay. And statement is, every exponential vector is an eigenvector of this operator with eigenvalue the inner product so this is an eigenvalue equation and this gives you an infinite family of operators annihilation operators of course you linearly extend it so it is defined on e note that the f2 af is antilinear because of my definition of conjugacy. The left hand side conjugate, therefore it is antilinear means conjugate linear. It is additive and gets complex conjugated. And it's also clear AF maps the exponential vectors into exponential vectors because they are eigenvectors. So, so exponential vectors are, are st stable under annihilation operator. The next one is called creation. These names are suggested. Again, these names came from the physicists. Uh, now, this one is much more complicated to define than that.
and it is written as this way. So this is not plus but the dagger. But one need not have put that, but that's a. So how do I define this? I want to define its action on exponential vectors. So note, so this is a side remark. Note that for every t real, I can define the following map on the exponential vector, okay, and fix a g in the vector space, okay, in the base space H. For a t real number and a vector g in the base space, I can define the following transformation where the exponential vector E f goes to E of f plus T g. Okay. I translate it. I translate in the base space. Base space is a vector space. Okay. Therefore, I can have a translation group acting on it. It is an infinite dimensional translation group. Because the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional in general. We have not said it, but for our case, everything is infinite dimensional. So, so it's an infinite dimensional translation group in the base space. And that is being represented by this map f going to a plus t g. So g is fixed for every t you have a translation. So this is what is called the translation in the direction of g. Okay. So in three dimension for example I translate along the diagonal of this room. So that is the g. Okay. Now this gives rise to, so what, this is a translation and you can easily see if I call it some w t fixing g, then w t plus t prime is equal to w t w t prime. Okay. So this is an additive group of real numbers is being represented in this. And a dagger f in some sense is the generator of this additive group of translations. So there is an i factor here which I have to get right minus i so you differentiate the translated vector in the direction of g at t equal to 0 that is the generator of translation okay Oh yeah, you are right. I have interchanged G and F. Yeah, because F comes here, so I should have this here. Question? Do you understand this? I have translated. You see, this I will come back to. This is a. Uh, do you see this? This is trivial. Just act again on it. So just in the same direction, G I'm I'm translating in the same direction. Okay, I'm not mixing up the directions. This will follow immediately. So it is a representation of the additive group of real numbers. But what I am not saying, and this is acting in the Fox space because it is defined on the exponential vectors, and if it has nice properties, then I can extend it on the whole sp space because exponential vectors form a total set, do not forget. But that nice property, this will just miss a little bit. It is not an isometry, it is actually to make it an isometry you have to add a little factor here. I will come to that. So now to verify, For example, uh, so take the inner product of the action of the annihilation operator on the right hand side and uh, another exponential vector and you verify this identity. is true 
for every g, h, and f. in the base space. It is an elementary computation. You start with the right hand side and uh, so you will get this will become so what is this? This will become the right hand side is minus i d d t. Of course I am sweeping under the carpet you should have asked that's why I said ask. I did not say in what sense I take the derivative what topology. Okay this is actually strong topology. I put a S. So this derivative is being taken in the strong topology of the Fox space. Okay? And it exists. So that needs a little calculation to show that the strong derivative exists. But once strong it is a strong derivative, then it is a weak derivative, therefore I can apply it here. Okay, I've just put this expression there. This inner product you well know from this formula. And then you differentiate. That's a number, the de derivative of exponential function. So that's an elementary computation. And then put e equal to 0. And you will get. this expression to show that this equality holds. Okay, This is an elementary exercise left to you. Just sit down and do it. It will take two and a half minutes. That half is important. Okay, So this is a small exercise for you. This one is a little more time consuming to show that the strong derivative exists. Once you have that, this is elementary. This is a little more time consuming. What you have to show is that this is a Cauchy sequence. So it needs a little computation, just a bit more than this one, but not difficult. It just takes a little more time. In fact, let me give you, so this is a hint, which itself you should prove, but that's elementary. So compute this. And elementary computation will give you the following. Yeah. Not in that form. Why, 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 why do you think I should use Stone's theorem? I mean, and how? Tell me. Yes, but that's not enough to apply Stone's theorem. You need something more. Yeah, what is that? No. Even before continuity, you need something far more paramount. You are forgetting a very simple word. Unitarity. Stone's theorem, unitary one parameter group of continuous one parameter group. That's why I said it is a group, but it is not unitary. I have not claimed it is unitary. To make it unitary, you have to do a little bit of surgery. Once you do that, yes. And that constant, you have to put the constant. Constant of modulus 1. I will probably state that. But yes, true. But everything depends on this, this trivial but little bit longer estimate, which is, uh, I leave it to you to do, which is make this following estimate.
So this is a elementary estimate. You do that. Once you have it, so you keep g fixed. H minus g is going to 0. Okay. So this goes to 0. If h converges to g in the base space, Hilbert topology of the base space. Use that simple estimate to prove everything that you need to prove here. Because here what will happen, you will have g plus tf and you will have g plus sf. Okay. Let's say s is, uh, well, you can keep the s fixed and let t move towards s. Then you choose, well, I have interchange f and g, that keeps on happening. Uh, I'm sorry for that. But here h is moving towards g, that means if h is equal to sf, sg, and I mean, g I replaced by tg, then this will become t square minus s square into norm g square and so on and so forth. Similarly here and so the continuity will be almost uh, transparent. Okay. So this is for continuity. So that says this is a continuous representation on the exponential vectors. Now to raise it from exponential vector to every vector in the Hilbert space, you need something more. Okay. You need some kind of kind of what do you need? If you have something conti continuous on a total set or a dense set, I, you need uniform boundedness. And that will follow once I have put in the factor to make it unitary. Unitary family is all bounded by one. Norm bounded, so I can extend the continuity to the whole Hilbert space. So this is an elementary computation which if you just have to grind through a little bit. It is just a question of writing it down. But there are operative theoretic non-trivial issues here. All it says, now, now the question that will come as soon as you get this equality what does it say? You see, A, you have the, the adjoint of the operator AF. Uh, well, the operator is densely defined. That comes from, uh, oh, I have wiped the definition. So it has an adjoint. Is a linear densely defined operator, it has an adjoint. Now, question is the equality of these two. Okay. That needs much more work. So I won't even bother to state it. It is actually true, but that is a non-trivial. In that estimate, is there a modulus at the end of one second? Oh, yeah, correct. Thank you. So this I won't bother to even prove. But important thing to realize that unlike, well, you can even probably see it, I said that AF maps exponential into exponential. A dagger F does not map. Unlike the annihilation operator, it does, it, it does not keep the exponential vector stable. So that leads to a little bit of bother in computations, but one gets around it. For example, once you have introduced these two operators, it is important to compute I mean, E means linear combination of linear span of exponential vectors. So, then that is the domain. That is the domain. That's why I said the domain of that joint is, is not just the exponential vectors. That's the problem. That's what I didn't want to say. That's why the, this 
question mark is left unanswered. This says it is symmetric, or well, it is not symmetric, but this is the, what does this say? This says a dagger f is equal to a dagger f restricted to E is a f star. That's what it says. Contained in a f star. Contained in a f star, yes. That's all it says. It doesn't say, because the domain is going to be not <coughs> just E. It will be somewhat bigger. If you want <coughs> this equality to hold, you have to define it on a slightly bigger domain. I don't want to go through that because it is not so important for our what we want to do. So this is the next calculation or next object of interest. Uh, let me get it right, otherwise I will get it all messed up. Again, a slightly long calculation, but not difficult. Okay. So for me, G, K, F, H, all, all, all lowercase letters are elements in the base space. Okay. Sorry, this should be a dagger. I want to compute this difference. The second one is easy to compute because these are all eigenvectors, so this is quite trivial. What is this? F k because it is antilinear in the left variable, left entry, so it gets complex conjugated, and here it is g h times the inner product of e k and e h in the Fox space. So the notations are the same for inner product, but you have to understand in the context where the inner product is being taken. Okay. All the F, G, H, K, etc. are all in the base space, whereas E, K, E, H are all in the exponential space. So this one is easy to compute. This one is a little more complicated for obvious reason, because this is a little indirect definition. So you have to compute this by using definition. And so I don't do that. So this I leave. So you have to do what? This is equal to minus. You have to of inner product of So apply the definition which is here still. So this is not very difficult to write it down and grind and you will get the following result. Let me give the result. So you mean the first term is equal to that one? Yes. So you grind through, that is you write it as exponential, so this will become, you know what it is, k plus tg inner product f plus sh. So you can open it up, differentiate and there will be several terms. You will notice one of them will cancel this exactly and will leave finally the following. In other words, finally this term will, will, will cancel with one of the terms, there, there will be two terms, and finally this will be left. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, this is all at t equal to s equal to 0, yeah, yeah. 
and thereby giving you the finally the following relation. So what happens? So this equality, that this difference is equal to this, is often expressed as follows. Oops. This is the commutator of two operators. Well, uh, so this I have taken it there, but that is, a, as I said, uh, I have not explained that this is the domain, but a posteriori it is, because this is well defined, this is a number, and if you have got this, then that means that this is in the domain of this, and you can flip it over, okay? But that assumes this equality, which I have not explained, okay? So this should be understood as this, to be the least complicated, otherwise domain issues become quite paramount, which I don't want to get involved in, okay? So this is the so-called canonical commutation relation. CCR. There are many ways of coming at that. I, we have, I have taken a one route, but there, there are many, many routes which lead to the same expression. Okay, so these are two, well, the two operators I have introduced as sort of special operators which will interest us all through. Let me introduce the third one and then I will stop. So this is called, again, the terminology comes from physicists, it's called second quantization. You see, if, why is the word second? Okay, so the word second came from the following. The base space operations that you've been doing are the sort of, in a sense, uh, the first quantization, okay? When you are lifting it to the exponential space or Fox space, it somehow came with the name of so-called second quantization. So that name has often stuck. I mean, many people use it, some people don't use it, but. So, let T be of the base space, okay? Let him start with a, any, any bounded operator, just to make Joydev happy uh, in, a, in a base space. Then I want to define something, I will write this, this is gamma. Gamma of T, I will define it on exponential vectors as E of Tf. So this is a natural curiosity. On the base space, I can have bounded operator acting on all vectors. Bounded operator, by that I mean defined everywhere, okay? So this makes perfect sense, okay? So the right-hand side makes perfect sense as an operator in the Hilbert, in the, in the Fox space. But does it define a bounded operator in the Fox space? Answer is no. Though T is bounded, okay? Answer is no. So to so one of the simple one of the simplest thing you can see easily, uh, I mean you can check that this does not necessarily define a bounded operator. E is to take t to be a contraction. Then this can be extended to a, as a bounded operator. For every contraction t, gamma t extends as a contraction. So the little lemma or theorem for every contraction, 
T in H, gamma T is a contraction in gamma S of H. And the proof is, I, I think, not very trivial, actually. At first, I mean, it, at first one would wonder why is it so complicated, but it is because of the linear extension that's what you have to do. So you define as the natural thing, namely, okay, so that's the natural linear extension on fi all finite sum. Now you have to somehow bound this norm, the right hand side. Okay, so the right hand side norm has to be bounded with respect to, in other words you have to compute inner product and control it in terms of This inner product you have to control in terms of this inner product. This you can, cannot do unless T is a contraction. Because the powers keep on going up, you see, it is a tensor product. So T also attains tensor product increase. Okay? You won't be able to extract this out of that. So this is again a small exercise. Please do it. It is, a, as I said, the hint is to use tensor product. Okay, structure effectively, that's all. Then you will see it yourself, why the contraction is necessary. In particular unitary maps, which is of course a contraction, then let me make it here itself. Let H be bounded self-adjoint in the base space. So it is a bounded self-adjoint operator in the base space, associate with it e to the power minus i t h, some u t, which is unitary for every t, put it here for every t, this makes sense, sorry, yeah, this makes sense because it is a contraction for every t, okay, and you can see so, and in fact, you can prove in the case of unitary, this is actually equal. If T is unitary, this is an isometry because it preserves the inner product. Second, its range is again exponential domain because T is unitary, so I can invert it. Therefore, it has a dense range, so you have an isometry with a dense range, therefore it is unitary. So gamma of unitary is unitary. Okay, that is the lesson. Not only it is a bounded operator, but it is actually unitary. So gamma of ut gives me a one parameter unitary group. Okay. So as you said, we are almost ready to apply Stone's theorem, but why I say almost? We are not yet ready. We have to do a little bit something. Continuity. You have to prove strong continuity. Okay. Strongly continuous. This is a group, so it pro enough to prove continuity at zero. And how do you prove continuity at zero? So at zero, this is identity. So all you have to prove because this is a total set, and you are looking at unitary continuity of unitaries. Okay, so you look at the total set. So E of U T F minus E of F. This norm square is what you have to look at, and that will go to zero by this estimate. This is the master estimate, if you like. Just put f and g appropriately. This you can, because ut goes to identity in the base space. 
So continu strong continuity follows from the strong continuity of the base space, in the base space. Therefore, by Stone's theorem, I can apply and I will get a generator. That means gamma of ut can be written as e to the power minus it times something. At that something, of course, will depend on this generator here. It is written sometimes lambda h, gamma h, etc. Various notations. Sir, I think KRP or Parthasarathy uses this lambda h notation. So I will stick to it. <coughs> so that's the third fundamental or special operator that we will need. Okay, coming from this kind of action on the exponential domain. One was is an eigen, I mean one was such that exponential vectors were eigenvector. That was the annihilation. The creation was some kind of adjoint of it. And third one is coming from what is called second quantization or exponentiation of a strongly continuous unitary group in the base space, which gives rise to a strongly continuous unitary group in the Fox space and gives you a generator which I denote as lambda h if the generator of the base one was h. Okay? So h to lambda h is a functorial connection again. Okay? And these three we'll work with, but these three were essentially what was introduced by Hudson and Patasarathy to do their calculus, quantum So that is where we are heading with these three operators. But more recently, we, we have introduced a fourth operator. Okay, that I will also. So this is post Hudson Patrasarathi. Hudson Patrasarathi ended with these three operators and their calculus. So, in some sense, as I will show next time, this is the so called infinite dimensional Laplacian. I will explain in what sense this represents this kind of infinite dimensional Laplacian. So I want to introduce another infinite dimensional Laplacian. Now this word Laplacian of course is used because of analogy only. Okay, it is not a differential operator in the conventional sense. But it is infinite dimensional that means if you want to compare with finite dimension then it would behave as if you have infinite number of coordinates going out, as if it is on R infinity. Okay. Another infinite dimensional Laplacian I will introduce is known as Gross Laplacian after Leonard Gross. Which is different from that Laplacian. So there are many, many Laplacians that you can write down in infinite dimension. This is the most common one and this is after that the next common one, I should say. Then there is Levy Laplacian is the still more exotic. After Levy, the probabilist. Gross also was a probabilist, essentially probabilist. Okay. So these are essentially arising from, you know, in, 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 you have, here you are doing probability theory over infinite dimensions. You have not recognized it because I have not used the word probability. I have used it rather rarely. But it is a, for example, the uh, translation group is an infinite dimensional translation group, right? Because your base space is infinite dimensional. So where does differentiation comes from? Think in group, group theoretic language. Ordinary differentiation comes from translation in appropriate dimensions, 2, 3, 4, 5, n. The Laplacian also comes from translation in n dimension. Here we are translating in infinite dimension. We already have a differentiation, namely this one, of infinite dimensional translation. Right? So I would expect a Laplacian to emerge from it, just as it, as it did for finite dimension. Right? What is a, a Laplacian in finite dimension? What is it? Finite Euclidean dimension, you have the translation group, Rn. 
So from the translation group emerges via Stone's theorem, the directional derivative in each of the coordinate direction, if G you fix as the coordinate direction, that will give you the partial derivatives, del del i, okay, del del xi. If you fix the ith coordinate axis, that will give you the del del xi, okay. If G is the ei, then the, what you will get a dagger is nothing but what we call partial derivative with respect to the xi direction. And then Laplacian is, you do it twice and sum them up. Okay, del del xi square, del 2 del xi square, sum over i equal to 1 to n. Okay. Here, you have infinite number of directions. Okay, the underlying base space is infinite dimensional separable Hilbert space. So, you have countable infinity of coordinate directions. So, you would like to have something like del del xi square sum over i from 1 to infinity, right? That will be the naive thing to uh, expect. But that unfortunately does not define an operator in any reasonable space. Why? Think about it. Why it does not define an operator? It is related to group theory. Because in infinite dimensional Euclidean space or Hilbert space, there does not exist a Lebesgue measure. Lebesgue measure does not, there is no, no invariant measure. Okay. There is no Haar measure. Lebesgue measure is the Haar measure of the translation group in Rn. That does not exist. As soon as that ceases to exist, your Laplacian will change immediately. It has to change. It forces a change on the Laplacian. That's why you have problems. And that's why it is interesting, because you have problems. Right? Okay. And that's why there are so many Laplacians. So next time I'll try to uh, explain. So this is related to group theory in the sense that you, the, these are infinite dimensional groups. And the, this, uh, this is the Lie algebra of, of that particular group. It is an infinite dimensional Lie algebra as you can immediately recognize because G and F are running over infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So it is, a, it is not a Lie group in the conventional sense because they are all finite dimensional. This is an infinite dimensional algebra. I cannot use the word Lie strictly speaking because it is not a Lie group. Questions? Stop me, like he stopped, I, I, I appreciate that. And uh, ask questions, because I think there is a lot to be thought about. You know, it is not the calculation which is important. Of course, you should do the calculations to convince yourself that what I am saying are more or less true. <laughs> there may be some plus minus I mistake possible, but are more or less true. But I think the conceptual part, I would place at least equally important, if not more. Why so much fuss about Laplacian in infinite dimension? Because there is no Lebesgue measure. Yeah, I will say that. No, I won't say that in, in discussion. Discussion, if we are having it, I would welcome it. But it all depends on you people. But then ask about what I have discussed. Because that I am going to do in a regular lecture anyway. So don't presuppose it. Okay. I will give it. Next lecture will consist of actually giving these two things. Namely lambda of h I will elaborate. Okay. As one possible Laplacian. And then I will define the gross Laplacian. Which one? Gross Laplacian. No, classical Laplacian. Classical? You are talking about classical Laplacian? Oh, okay. That I can explain. Yeah, sure. You are not talking about gross Laplacian. You are talking about Laplacian. Okay. You see, I don't know, you have had, in, in school probably you must have, have, if you have done vector calculus, have you heard the word vector calculus? That means finite dimensional vectorial calculus. 
then you have you heard the thing uh, diff grad gradient you know divergence you know okay so div of grad is the laplacian but of course if it is a flat space then it comes out to be exactly what i said summation over i from 1 to n del 2 del xi2 where these are the partial derivatives in the ith coordinate directions okay you know what i am saying is just just yeah the for three dimension for example and is just the standard laplacian is this one right or n it doesn't make any difference so this is the expression for the standard laplacian and it is often written as delta capital delta now there is a difference of notation between uh, even amongst mathematicians there are differences some people take the minus sign in it some people don't the some usually it is useful to put a minus sign here because that makes it a non negative operator that's why often people introduce a minus sign as well in the definition but that's a matter of convention that's not very important but that is the usual flat laplacian that means a laplacian in euclidean space n dimensional euclidean space as soon as you go to non flat space a riemannian manifold with a non trivial curvature that expression change that's why i i said grad uh, div grad is a better expression because div grad takes into account the curvature of the space okay and that is called then the laplace operator is called laplace beltrami operator because beltrami wrote down the curved space version first laplace used the flat version only so that is your laplacian this is second order differential operator Twelve. 